Hey everyone, welcome to Watch and Listen. This episode of Watch and Listen, and indeed this whole year of Watch and Listen, is brought to you by Crown and Caliber, the best place to shop, buy, and sell luxury watches online. Whether it's Rolex, it's an Omega, a Breitling, a Cartier, Audemars Piguet, or any other brand, check Crown and Caliber first. They might have it. Only the suckers buy Swiss watches brand new. Most of them take an initial depreciation hit just like a car, and most of them are durable enough to last a lifetime with care. That's why buying used is the way to go. And where does Crown and Caliber get all these beautiful watches in their store? From collectors and people just like you. If you've got an extra watch laying around, maybe something you don't wear very much, something you outgrew, something that even you think might be out of style, you know what? That might be someone else's style. You could sell that watch or you can trade that watch to Crown and Caliber towards a new watch from their stock that is ever changing. Uh, they've got specially trained watchmakers on staff. They can service timepieces for you. Um, and, uh, and everything that they sell you uh, is guaranteed to work as advertised. Uh, and if you don't like it, send it right back, get your money back. Uh, I traded in two watches for one watch, and I found it very easy. The uh, sell process was super easy, and uh, and I got the watch that I wanted quickly, and it was exactly as it looked on the site. Uh, check them out at crownandcaliber.com. Also, we're sponsored by Beeline Coffee. It is a delicious brand of uh, finely engineered coffee roasts from all over the world, whether it's Ethiopia, Central America, South America, the islands. They've got blends from all over, and they are delicious. Single origin coffee. You got to brew it in like an AeroPress or a pour over. Uh, you got to treat the coffee with love. You can't just like slap it together. But if you do, you are rewarded with a truly delicious cup of coffee. Uh, I've got my own roast with Beeline, uh, the uh, the Smoking Tire Roast. Cameron Weiss has his own roast with Beeline, Weiss Watch Company Roast. Check them out. Use code CHRONO to get 15% anything off the Beeline Coffee store at BeelineCoffee.com. Uh, all right, today on Watch and Listen, we are talking about chronographs. Uh, a chronograph is basically a stopwatch, and uh, it's not something that I have given much thought to in the past, as I imagine many of you have not either, but man, as Cameron will teach me today, there is a lot to the art of the chronograph. So sit back, relax, pour a cup of Beeline coffee, and enjoy this episode of Watch and Listen. Everybody, hello, welcome to Watch and Listen. Sit down, grab a pint of something, and get your finger condoms on. Yeah. Because it's time to touch some movements. What's <laughs> happening, everybody? I hope you're having a good day and a good week. Uh, I hope you don't mind the shakeup. We had a uh, Cameron. I don't know if I even told you this, but because your wife handles the social media, yeah. Cameron Weiss, he spends his time buried in watches and <laughs> That's for the best. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we're doing uh, two episodes of the Smoking Tire podcast per week now, Tuesdays and Thursdays, which means we here at Watch and Listen have been bumped to Wednesdays. The assholes in charge bumped us to Wednesdays. Who is doing this? What a jerk. Uh, what <laughs> a jerk indeed. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope you uh, are ready to learn about chronographs. Boy, am I. Cameron... We have discussed the chronograph uh, in the past, the El Primero movement, and the and actually, for what I found the most interesting about it is that you said the chronograph isn't like an abusive function on the watch. Very, it's harsh on the watch. Yeah, and so uh, I thought, and you thought, you actually, I think, were the one who said we need to do a whole episode on chronographs, didn't you? Yeah. This was your idea. Yeah, I Why think there could be many that? episodes on chronographs. Why? All right. What is it about? It's just a stopwatch, it, right? Why is it that a chronograph should have a whole hour of radio dedicated to it? It is one of those movements that is very hard to make, 
So there's always been a lot of competition mm -hmm. within the marketplace and a lot of people trying to set themselves apart from others that made a chronograph or I made mine different or we get a chronograph from somebody else and then we have to make it our own. Um, so there's a lot, and a lot of the companies, they all have a chronograph, but what do they make in the chronograph? What is their addition to it? Um, and all of, all of that is very interesting, but the chronograph has to work. Yeah. It has to work and it has to reset and it's something so simple. I mean, I feel like non-watch people or even just casual watch people that are not nerds, you know what I mean? Take the chronograph completely for granted. Yeah. It almost seems simpler than telling the time itself. Right. You know, because it doesn't need to be like relative to anything. It's yeah. just it's just itself. Like, why why is a chronograph such a difficult thing to make? It's another another mechanism inside the watch that's all mechanical memory. Basically, when you're hitting the button, it's remembering when you hit the button. And it's marking that in time, and then it's tracking the time from when you hit that button to the time you hit the button next. Yeah. And then it has to be able to reset the hands back to zero. And it has to do it instantly. All of these functions have to happen instantly. So it's something that you think it's, oh, yeah, well, it's just it's measuring time, and it already measures time by actually telling you the day or the, the time of the day, but it has to have a second time-telling feature in it that can start, stop, reset, all of which are very complex, and you're dealing with a <coughs> tiny little amount of power that you're then draining for this whole other part of the watch that has to remember when you hit that button. That that well that makes sense, right? <laughs> why, is, why it's so complicated? But yeah, it doesn't to... until you break down every little thing that it needs to do. What other is there any other function on a watch that is as complicated as a chronograph? There are other complicated things. But no, the, right? But like the if chronograph, just one, yeah, the one, the, the one thing that could add the most complexity to any given watch. So the, the tough things about a chronograph are that they have to mesh with your timekeeping instantly. Mm -hmm. Whereas the date, it could switch over any time between like, right. you know, uh, 10 o'clock and 2 a.m. Nobody's yeah. sitting there watching and wants it to jump immediately. Uh -huh. uh, so all these date functions and jumping things and whatever, they're, they're not instant. None of it's instant. So it's really about the right now engagement of the yeah. gear. Right now it has to engage. Uh -huh. It has to engage accurately. Mm -hmm. And then once it's engaged, it's draining the movement. It's actually adding extra stress onto the movement. And it has to keep time because the one thing you're trying to do is accurately <coughs> count time at that point. So you can't have a a problem with the timekeeping. Right. You're it not only has to keep the the time, it now has to keep your time on yeah. top of that. It's you yeah. know, it has to it has to go imagine to do a car metaphor, imagine a car accelerating at a constant rate from zero to a hundred miles an hour, and halfway there at fifty, a piano lands on it, and they both need to immediately be going 50. Yeah. The car can't be interrupted, and the piano has to get to 50 right this fucking second. Yeah. Literally right this this second. Yeah. <laughs> because we're talking about a stopwatch. And a lot of people take the the chronograph for granted. It's like... I did until you, until you started... Yeah. And you, until you said, this is the most abusive complication. I was like, wait, what? Abu I, I, what? I yeah. don't understand the, the concept of that. So... Let's get into chronographness. What do you have under the dome? Oh, it's not quite lined up. Sorry. Here we go. There you go. You brought a dome with yeah. a movement on it. So with chronographs, mm -hmm. you're going to hear people talk about modules and then integrated chronographs. So uh, like I said, the chronograph works with the movement. So you're either going to have a module that goes on top of the timekeeping that has all the chronograph parts, or you're going to have something that was integrated completely into the movement from the beginning, which is an integrated chronograph. Uh -huh. This one is a Dubois de Pra module attached to the front of an ETA movement. Okay. So this is an ETA 2824 workhorse automatic movement. It's been around a very long time. It's a great movement. And then on the front, nice, is but this, nothing special. Yeah, nothing special, but mechanical. It's a yeah, mechanical. Actually, it has an automatic. That's an automatic. yeah, automatic. Yeah, okay. 
So you have your mm-hmm. regular automatic movement, mm-hmm. which means the movement itself is going to be very easy to service, which is a good thing. The module on front, not so easy to service. They're very complex. Um, but the module essentially bolts onto the front and so it has all the chronograph keeping in that little sandwich thing on the front that's the larger diameter Use between your my fingers there. Use your pointer. The, the, the module, it looks like, okay, your movement is like a two-story building. And the yeah. module is like building a third story on that building. Yeah, so you've got <clears throat> module up here on the front, this sandwich area. Yeah. Everything back that side over here is going to be your movement. Now, the question is this, right? The movement has the same... You haven't changed anything about the ETA movement to make it module ready, have you? Like, is this are the springs heavier duty because it no. has more stuff to move? No. In so fact, how does you that could, work? So this movement, they're just working within the amount of power that they've got. Okay. So you have a known amount of power with this particular movement. Yeah. And then Dubois Dupra, who is a module maker, they've designed this module uh-huh. so that it works with that amount of power. So the torque that's coming <clears throat> through your cannon pinion and yeah. your hour wheel on the front side, where you normally you just put your hands... That is then being circumnavigated, and you're adding extra components onto right, that right. outside of that. And then on a higher level, you'll have your hands. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's like if you took your car and you had it running something else at yeah. the same time <laughs> that you're driving. Yeah. And you need to make sure you don't drain too much power off the engine of the car. Otherwise, your car is not going to get you where you need to go. And it's not even... We're not talking about, like, a truck pulling a trailer. We're talking about a truck pulling a trailer, and then those trailers' rear wheels, the freewheeling wheels, had a transmission that then turned a shaft and turned a fan. Yeah. And that fan is your hands. Yeah. And the hands aren't being turned by the engine anymore. They're being turned by some other stuff that's, like, eight steps removed from your engine. Yeah. Right? Because the power has to go... Am I right? Yeah. Does the power have to go all the way through that chronograph and then back out? Right? Yeah. It's got to go through the whole... The whole mechanism on the front is essentially a sandwich of spring-loaded parts. Right, yeah. All of your chronograph pieces are hooked in through the dial, including your start-stop reset buttons, all on the dial side. That is crazy. So there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. Oh, the but and the buttons have to yep. go into your modules. Where do the buttons go? The buttons Wait. are right here on the front, and then they hang down. Oh, yeah. I never thought about where like the buttons had to go. So here's where your crown goes right into that hole, and then you've got your button there Wait, and your button you, here. Is it possible to turn the light up brighter on there? Do we have a little a little boop boop? Nope, wrong way. One. Uh, wrong way. You're making it darker, I hit the, I son. Hit the plus. I no, hit you the did plus it. Button. No, there you did it. How's that look? There you go. Looks nice. Now it looks good. Um, so you can see the hole for the stem yeah. right there. So front of that, right here, that's where your module starts. And it's just, it's just screwed right on. Yeah. It's and so does your, your regular movement has like an output shaft, right? That that would be what the hands yeah, would go on? Yeah, the dial that, side? Yeah, and that's what turns the module? Or does it tap in somewhere else? No, that's that's what powers it the, from where the, the dial from, side. From the dial side, yeah. Yeah. So your Crazy. actual hour and minute hands are powering the chronograph. That is that you would normally have. Yeah. So weird. How yeah. cool. So it is a pretty neat setup, and what that allows How you to do. How does that not interrupt the power when you engage it? I don't get it. It has to be a very smooth transmission of power through the chronograph. Otherwise, you can have some problems. Are there uh, like clutches that engage, or is it just teeth that come together and slam together? So that's a a good thing to talk about, actually, because there's another difference in chronographs, which is horizontal clutch and vertical clutch. I've heard those terms. I have no idea what they mean. Yeah. So I'm going to cover this. Um, What you have is either you're going to have a horizontal clutch, and I'll put my hands up here so people can see it. Maybe I can find a thing. Um, Yeah, I'm sure uh, you can find a thing. But horizontal clutch is going to be um, when the wheels come in, uh huh, and then like two parallel gears. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're gonna come in on a horizontal plane and touch each other. Here's a here's a something. Is this a thing? Uh oh. It might be, but that image was of a of a column wheel. <sighs> Never which mind. I just got doesn't ad. necessarily forget it. Forget yeah. it. Ads. 
Anyway, so continue to use your hands. The, the horizontal clutch mm-hmm. will come in, and the teeth are already on the same level, and they touch. That's how you start your chronograph. Okay. Those wheels engage. They slam together. It's rough. That's one of those things that is very rough. They yeah. slam together. A lot of force. Uh, and if it's too much, they won't turn because there's not a lot of torque in those wheels. So if, if they slam together and they really have too much tension together, they won't turn. It'll lock up. If they slam together and they're not close enough, meaning the teeth are just loosely touching, if your wheels aren't will, concentric, will it slip? it'll slip. You'll see your chronograph, like maybe a 55 to 60, it's not going to run the seconds. Oh. It'll stop, and then it'll start again. Huh. Um, so that's a problem. But then you have your vertical clutch, okay. which you're going to see it in a lot of modules will have a setup like this, where you're essentially, um, a wheel is like this, and a spring is lifting it up. Oh, okay, and yeah. And then it's engaging that way. Oh, yeah, that makes so sense. So you hit the button, and you've got a wheel here. The spring slides in and lifts uh-huh. it up, and is your wheels Is that a smoother engage. engagement, the vertical clutch? Yeah, it's it's not as intense. Do However, they cut the gears on an angle, or is it literally no, like it's, it's, it's just all flat, right yeah. on flat to yeah. itself? Wow. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's going to be harsh either way. Yeah. And then is your is your reset function equally harsh? Um, your reset is way worse. Way worse. Yeah. Okay. Reset's very intense. Reset is a hammer slamming down on heart shaped cams, uh, heart shaped because the top of the heart if you hit anywhere on the bottom side of the heart anywhere that is not the top of the heart with a flat hammer it will flip around until the hammer rests on the two tops of the heart okay makes sense mm, yeah i wish i found a better picture for that but is wait what are you right over i don't know i don't know i i it sounds. Have you used the term hammers right here? Hear yeah. this? Yeah, pull that one up. Okay. So this go. is your hammer. It looks like an right, antler. Hang on. So here's a hammer on the right side of this image. Okay. Yeah. It and does then, look like a reindeer antler. Yeah. And then here you've got a heart shaped cam. Mm-hmm. That's the bottom of the heart sticking out. So actually right. I see the heart shaped like cam. Yeah. Okay. There's a round wheel, but on the same shaft as a heart shaped cam. Yeah. Like one lobe of a car's camshaft. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. So when it slams down on this pointy side, oh, this yeah. hammer will slam down here, and this uh-huh. hammer will slam down there. Both hands will reset to zero by pressing on the cam until it finds the top of the heart. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah, has yeah. to all be lined up properly, and wow. this hammer slams down hard. <laughs> That's crazy. So if you when you get a chronograph service, then are you going to have a much more like serious service to deal with because these parts get more worn? I mean, if you're really using it a lot? Yeah, um, especially mm-hmm. in here. Oops, sorry, so we were on you. vertical and horizontal about, clutch. The top there, yeah. Yeah, we were on vertical and horizontal clutch. Yeah. So this is a good image for that uh, horizontal clutch. Okay. Because this wheel here, the small A wheel. There's an A on, on it on the image, yeah. Right now, this chronograph is not running. Okay. When you hit the start button, uh-huh. this chronograph will be slammed into this wheel. The main wheel on the dial. Yes. Or the, the, the dial, cent- the center, central one. center, so yeah. Uh, it's being powered by this wheel, which ties into the regular gear train. Okay. Over here. So it makes this three-wheel gear train. Okay. Which then will turn this wheel every minute. Oh, all right. So the, that's the seconds wheel, and then that's a minute wheel. Yeah, so this is your 60 oh. seconds there. So... This is pretty start, complicated. Uh, yeah, it is. On all of these pieces, you have to be able to start. This is your little memory here of how to start up here. So wait, so this top this top image to the right of number A, yeah, is your memory of where to go back to. Yeah, to zero. So that's the cam for start, stop, reset. This is nuts. It's, it's multiple levels of cams. So crazy. Yeah. So this will slam into there on start. It'll remove on stop when you hit reset. The hammer will slam down on the heart cams and reset your wheels wow. and your hands to zero. Okay. So, in theory, right, we've got what uh, 10 chronographs on the table here. Yeah, we have a lot of chronographs. <laughs> in theory, they all do the same thing. They, yeah. measure, they measure time according to your schedule. Right. Start yeah. when I want, stop when I want, and reset. Yeah. Right. Only, in fact, we have one ret- one uh, split seconds. But other than that, they're just they're all chronographs, right? And yet, we find ourselves with an hour of radio to talk about chronographs. So, 
I think we need to start from <clears throat> excuse me simplest to most yeah. complex and crazy, and you need to tell me what is the difference in all these chronographs because according to you, there is one. Yeah. All right. Well, well we have some here that are very similar, but there are some huge similarities and some yeah. big differences. Yeah. And yet the function ultimately is the same. So mm-hmm. I, what I love is the different approaches to the same problem. So yeah. all right, let's let's dive. So where do you want to start, buddy? Uh, let's do Simplest. let's do this one. This is a popular chronograph. Or actually, let's do the original version of it. Your bomb Mercier. My old my old school. Oh, zoomed a little too far in there. Uh, my Balma Mercier Capeland chronograph from 2004, my college graduation present. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. What do you got? What is, What is it about this watch that is the entry level chronograph? I think this so, thing was around maybe three grand when it was new. Yeah. So this, from this subdial layout, knowing that it's a mechanical watch, you can look and you can see subdial here, here, and here. So we've got at Noon, nine, and six for okay. your subdials. Uh, then you've got hour, minute, and your central seconds is your chronograph seconds. This is the seven seven fifty movement, which is now made by Etta. Oh, okay. Uh, it's really easy to spot. They They're, all have the same layout. Yeah, they have that same layout. And can you, if you could, you make a watch that moved any of the elements around and still use that movement, or is it all they all just like this? They're pretty much all like this. There's a couple of variations for some of the bigger companies now, mm-hmm. and I have another one of them from Bon & Mercier. This is the same base movement, but they've altered it a little bit, and it's a newer one. Ooh, our, our shade needs to be... Right? What happened here? Sh- I don't know. We're getting a glare all of a sudden. Yeah. It sucks. It sucks. Where did you come Maybe from? move it over. I don't know. Damn. <laughs> I think it's because it's nighttime now, and we had to have the shades closed. I adjusted the light, and now look at our watches. Boom! Glare gone. All right. There we go. The power <laughs> of production. Okay. Dos Balma Merciers. So what's the newer one about? So the, the newer one, same movement, and this one has a display back, so I'll show you that movement here. What I have learned in reading about chronographs for the last couple of days to prepare for this show is that the higher end the chronograph, the less likely it is to be automatic because they want they don't want a, the rotor to hide the chronograph movement. Yeah. They want the manual wind. And we'll get we'll get there, don't worry. Yeah. But <laughs> at the entry level, most people want an automatic watch. Yeah. Definitely. Know. Uh so what are we looking at here? So this is the the back side of the Eta seven seven fifty. So same movement, basically. Basically same the base same movement. movement. Yeah. It's been altered a little bit, so you've only got the two registers on the front. And they're in a little bit of a different location. They have a different number for this. I think it's a 7753 or something like that. Um, but this is a Bum and Mercier caliber, so it'll have a different caliber number than the Eta because they have unique parts, unique decoration, unique markings, everything. Uh, but it was originally made at the same place as, as the uh, movement that's in yours with the, the more standardized layout. But this movement, so this is a horizontal clutch movement and the pinion that it's a pinion instead of a wheel that slams into oh really yeah so it's a pinion that actually little pin is tilted it's tilted at an angle okay and the wheel that it needs to engage is here oh so it kind of goes in at a bit of an angle yeah that might actually smooth the engagement out a little bit if it hits it at a bit of an angle it might kind of yeah it's like getting over a driveway in a corvette right (laughs) (laughs) so there's all these little different nuances that are unique and most people don't know about they just think chronograph chronograph Mm -hmm. it's a standard complication and it appears that way but a lot of the movements are shared until you get into the very crazy hundred thousand dollar watches and then you'll find a unique chronograph it's so crazy yeah Yeah. and and uh we don't have a daytona here for this one but even even that up until recently was just using other people's movements Yeah. yeah yeah What I found interesting, flip that Baum Mercier back over. What I find interesting is I didn't, it was something I didn't think about until I read it about this watch, which was that the movement itself is, uh, is a smaller movement, right? And the case is actually quite a big case. And when you have a chronograph like that, you really can't control the spacing of the subdials. And so they've got this this tachymeter scale that goes around the outside 
but like who nobody you who uses a tachymeter? Like nobody. I don't even know what that does, honestly. But what it does is it creates a buffer zone. It creates some extra space so you don't have to move the numbers all the way out. And so you don't realize the the subdials are actually sort of pushed towards the center. Yeah. And not really spread out. And when I started looking at some of the really expensive um chronographs one of the things that i realized that a way that they differentiate themselves uh, to show off that they're using their own movements is by spacing their subdials either in weird places or very far apart so you can be like ah it's not some tightly packed thing in the middle yeah and also a lot of the fakes will have subdials that are closer together than they should be yeah they're using the wrong movement for that watch yeah yeah so that's what. Although this is a very attractive watch. How much is this thing? It's, I think it's not particularly. I mean, everything's relative, but twenty eight hundred dollars. So yep. it's a it's a good attractive watch for twenty eight hundred dollars. Yeah, it's nice. Okay, so this is that's your entry level at Eta Chronograph. Uh, basically, like what you just showed me on the stand, right? Um. So what I showed you was an Eta with a module. Whereas right. the seven seven fifty is integrated. Oh, into that's the an integrated one. Oh, okay. So I, I have did not I have that. one of the seven seven fifty movements out of the case. Uh, so on here, if you want to zoom in, hang on. I'll move this a little bit. There you go. So over here, I come to you. Yep. You've got your uh, one of your chronograph wheels there, and over here, you're gonna have a pinion. That's the pinion that's going to. Slam into the the one wheel, and the where and the where's the wheel it slams into? Uh, it's hidden under it's this hidden bridge. behind the bridge. Yeah, okay, under yeah. the center here, and you've got your cam over here. So very similar to the Omega that you were seeing on the screen previously. To this guy, which is still on the screen now, except on this one, you've got this automatic bridge. Yeah, that see, that's a good comparison. Everything. Like, what a sad look it is to have the automatic right? bridge when look at this Omega. Yeah, where it's like the same thing, no automatic, wa- automatic rotor. Like, boom. Yeah, it's and much nicer. I love the manual yeah. wind. Stick around to the uh, end of the show because we have the we have the grand finale of of movement porn <laughs> <laughs> waiting for you. Okay, cool, neat. Okay, let's bump it up. Let's bump it up a step. What's the next? What's the uh, next step? Let's up go to here? this Panerai because that's that's multiple is, steps. Back no, it down. this is gonna blow your mind. This Panerai. Yeah. All right. Same all right. movement. All right. Let's back it down. Hang on. There we are. Move, move in. Move it in. I zoom it in. All right. Um, sorry, folks. I'm trying to do two things at once. Hit. There we go. The Panerai Luminor Marina uh, Regatta Ratraponte. Is that? Can you say the word better than I can? Retro, no, that was good. Ratraponte. Yeah. Which, which in Inglés, Ratroponte means split seconds chronograph or double chronograph, which is exactly what it sounds yeah. like. Um, such a cool complication. It's basically to time differentials. So one watch, uh, two race cars, uh, and you want to see who gets around the track faster. You got two race cars on the starting line. You can start uh, both chronograph hands together and then stop one. And then stop the other to time the difference between the yeah. two. So cool. And also, I imagine, even more complicated by a lot. You yeah. said you're going to blow my mind. Let's hear it. So this Panerai... Which is $10,000. Yeah. Very, and, and a unique complication on top of the Eta 7750. Really? Yeah. Wait a second. So you've got your start. Yeah. Start. You've got your stop. There's a stop. You can start it again. Uh huh. You've got your fly back here. Yeah, wait, where? Uh, might be a little hard to see on it's the screen. It's kind of hard to see on the screen. It's a very uh, thin silver hand that's hidden behind the blue hand, uh, the blue long center hand. So it's I'll actually, stop it right yeah. at six. I'm going to stop it. Okay. And you'll see a silver hand just appears out of nowhere from behind the blue central second hand. Boom. I just. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's not a, like a full hand. You need to be blocking something white to really see it in the screen yeah, anyway. You see yeah, there the it, yeah, there? yeah, when you turn it, when you turn it's it, it's easier to see. Got to catch the light, yeah. Yeah, so that's you so just then, stopped your your winner of the race, and then boom. Right back to oh. follow the blue hand. And then it continues. And it continues all yeah, f- yeah. like seamlessly. There's yeah. no jump in the blue hand when I stop the the silver hand. And then, of course, I can stop. 
So if this is a complication on top of the 7750, the 7750 has an integrated uh, chronograph. Mm-hmm. So it's just a split seconds complication for the second second hand? Yes. That's it? Yeah. Does that... Is that bad? Is that is that bad? No, is that no, that's that's the way to do it. That's the that's way. That's the way it's done. Yeah. And and so would would Panerai ha- create their own complication, or does Eta create that complication and then sell it to Panerai? Um, that complication is probably made by Dubois de Pra. I mm. don't know exactly, but it's something that kind of falls under their umbrella. And I I would guess that if I went and researched it, it's uh-huh. going to be a Dubois de Pra um, addition to an Eta seven seven fifty. I don't think Panerai would have made it because it's a very complex thing, and and they're not. I I don't want to say they're not like watchmakers, but they're that's not their main business is creating complications. They're artists. Yeah, they're, exactly. They're dial makers. Yeah, they bring it all together into a beautiful watch. <laughs> yeah, uh, and come up with the ideas and and make it. But the person to manufacture that component, the right person to go to, is going to be a, a place like Dubois de Pra. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. It's a lovely watch. It's very, right? very pretty. I, I, I already, before we started this podcast, when we took that out of the thing, I immediately emailed Crown and Caliber, and I was like, uh, demo for this week, please. Yeah. <laughs> and if you if you look closer... Let me see if I can look You'll closer. see the similarities. You've got that same bridge here. It's a little bit of a different shape, that automatic mechanism, that, that bridge that blocks everything so you can't see the chronograph, really. But if you tip it, so that your oscillating weight gets out of the way, you can see right here you've got your crown wheel, which the Eta 7750 is not a crown wheel chronograph. It is a um, cam-operated chronograph. So then that's what, the split seconds module? No, the, the crown wheel is actually a fancier, more complex way oh. of starting, stopping, and resetting. So who did would Etta do that for Panerai? Or is this just a different version this, of the 7750? It's a different version. Oh. Yeah. So this is a special thing. It's not sold to most companies. Uh-huh. Uh, Panerai is a very important company, very big. Um, plenty of funding. So they're able to do things like this. So this is a this is a special movement. This, this, oh, this is definitely a special okay. movement. Because yeah. I feel like when you were like, "Oh, I'm gonna blow your mind," and then you were like, "It's based on the same movement," I was like, "Oh, you blew my mind in the wrong way." It starts in the same, <laughs> but it's it Did starts. You want to break me down place. before building me up? Like <laughs> it's like a Gordon Ramsay move. Like, yeah, you suck, but you can do it. <laughs> We've got to tear down the walls and yeah. let you know that f- from like the entry level all the way through the. Really, like the mid level, you're gonna find that everyone started with the same movement. Yeah, everyone mid level, by the place. way, is like the price of a Honda Civic. More it's, than that, more than <laughs> like a mid level is gonna be like twenty thousand. Yeah, it's up. a brand new Honda Civic, yeah. not a brand, used one. A new, brand Honda new C- with all the options, yeah. <laughs> with Bluetooth. So. Yeah. Um, but so, okay, here's a question. So, for instance, to make another car analogy, as I'm apt to do, ZF makes transmissions for like a lot of people, right? And you hear us car guys talk about the ZF8 speed that is used in everything from Range Rovers to Jaguar sedans to BMW sedans and some SUVs to um, almost all Chrysler uh, Jeep uh, vehicles and on and on and on and on. But ZF licenses the design to Chrysler who build their own transmissions. So the 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 gearboxes that go into Range Rovers were built by ZF who designed yeah. them. The ones that go into Chrysler's were built by Chrysler under license from ZF. Is that how we can look at this movement or is this movement built by Eta and the module built by uh whoever Dupois if that what was it? Uh Dubois Dupra. Yeah. And, and that then, I don't know for sure on this one, but uh, but and, okay, forget this one. But let's just generalize. Would Panerai be, under license? Definitely, they would, would be, be making their movement under license from Eta, so they wouldn't design it, but they would manufacture it. Exactly. Okay, cool. And that yeah. happens. And then do other oh, people just straight up buy the movements from Eta? Yeah, exactly. You'll have different levels. You'll have companies that are buying the movements from Eta exactly as they sell them to other brands. Mm-hmm. You'll have people buying the movements from Eta decorated just for them. Right. Maybe have, a custom automatic winder yeah, exactly. or something. Uh, and then you'll have certain ones that are only available to certain tier brands. Right. 
And then you'll have something like this, which is going to be a step further where they're actually working with the Eta engineers and creating something different and then having it produced. Yeah. So Eta's not necessarily making these for them. No, but they're working with Panerai to make them. Yeah, Yeah, and they're starting from where Eta already was rather than starting from zero. Right, right. It's crazy. Yeah. You th- I mean, it's th- all right. All right. I'm with you. Now give right? me that. So I so can you put the strap back on that because I want to put yeah. it on now. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had. I feel naked. I'm, I'm watchless this whole episode. So that's a, we got a two thousand dollar watch all the way up to a ten thousand dollar limited edition Panerai that by most standards is very very pimp. Yeah. And with the with based on the same kind of technology. I mean, I guess. Right. You know, we have a, we have um. You know, we have very humble uh, police cars and uh, pickup trucks, you know, that share the same kind of basic architecture as the, the Corvette Z06, you know, in the Cadillac CTSV. You know, you've got a, you've got a, 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 a sil- basic Silverado 1500 truck that is not technologically uh, any different architecturally from the Camaro ZL1 that's running around the Nürburgring and, you know, it's seven and a half minutes. Um, so I guess you know you see this kind of stuff in uh, in cars as well. Um, what else? Where do we go from there? Uh, from there, let's I mean switch gears a little bit and uh, let's check out the check back in with Mr. Bulgari. Yeah, I think this that one is really cool because I think it is a uh, it's a very cool example of El Primero ness, right? His El Primero ness. So Let's, I think we need to go back. You gotta go. You have to go back and revisit the the chronograph story if you don't mind. The beginning so, of the chronograph story. Yeah. So with the uh, with Zenith, one of the biggest things that they've got is the original tooling for the production of this movement, and it's one of those things where if a brand shuts down and the tooling and the documentation uh, disappears. They have to start over. It's totally lost, and that stuff is almost priceless. Well, in many has, cases, right? It's just it's not even worth doing. Yeah, it's right? not even worth doing. Yeah. So having this El Primero is one of the reasons that LVMH can have Bulgari and have Zenith and produce chronographs where they actually make the chronograph. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had the funding to invest in actually designing a chronograph from the ground up. Certainly not a column wheel integrated uh, high beat chronograph that's automatic as yeah. well. I it's, keep reading that story about the El Primero chronograph. Uh, you know, the one guy saves the the tooling from the Nazis, basically. Yeah. Or not from the Nazis. <laughs> we get Nazi. From, they were going to toss it. You know, Zenith was yeah. so, so in deep with the quartz crisis, they said toss it. The one guy saves it. You know, and then all of a sudden, it's there. It's hidden. He literally he put it like behind a wall somewhere. Yeah, like stash, stash. Not even just like, <laughs> yeah, I'll hang on to it. Like s- s- sealed it in a right? wall. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just fumbling with this Panerai that looks really good on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Bulgari is they actually they it, they give it its own uh, reference for them or its own caliber, the BUL three two eight. Yeah. which is an El Primero with a Bulgari rotor on it. That's basically it. Yeah, this one has really nice decoration as well. Let me zoom in. So the this. bridges are a little different, uh-huh. and you can see a few more of the wheels. So for an automatic chronograph, this one's quite nice. You can yeah, they see, you really can even let you see, see a lot going on. Yeah, you can even see the, the winding wheels in the automatic spinning, which yeah. I've always loved on this particular movement because yeah. you can really see they should make the all the winding. wheels spoked like that because right? a lot of a lot of times you can't see stuff moving as much as you really could but if it was like spoked out then you really could yeah well and this wheel's just out in the open yeah when i may have when i have my dope watch company my automatic rotors are going to have as little they're going to be as as empty as possible so you could see yep. the most things why doesn't yeah. someone do a clear sapphire rotor how gangster would that be? So, you've <laughs> just taken us to the, the top level. Really? A sapphire uh, rotor is the top level? No, beyond sapphire. There are companies. Okay. Viani Alter does uh, what is that? a Who? Viani Alter. Viani Alter? How do you spell that? Uh, 
It is like uh, with a Y, and then it's H A L T E R V I A N N Y E Y. Oh, V I. Wait, V I E. Uh, no, no, no. What? Viani, How do you spell uh, Viani? V I A N E Y, I believe. Uh huh. Halter, H A L T E R. Okay, here we go. Viani Halter. What is what is tell what's Viani Halter about? Whoa. Okay, he's All he right. is one of my favorite watchmakers. Okay, so his 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 stuff is real crazy. You just go to his website. Yes. His he it's real steampunk. Very super um, super steampunk. This I think guy, the I think the classic Jean Vier. The classic Jean Vier. Masterpiece. Let's see if, if you can find of, a, a picture oh wait, equation of the back. Of t- oh. <laughs> All right, give me um, a second. I don't want to. Jesus, look at these things. Yeah, Th- this and this guy. This looks like that Jacob Astronomia thing. Does he make those for him? Does he, he make the he movement? He may have something to do with it. I'm not. I'm not totally not sure. Not to take credit away from Mr. Jacob, but it, that that thing really seems a lot right? like his the deep Jacob space Astronomia. Is what he calls it. That's so dope. Yeah, these guys are crazy. Okay, so. So he he did a sapphire oscillating weight oh, okay. uh, where it's sapphire, so you don't see it. You just see the bearing in the center so and then cool. nothing, and the weight is hidden around the edges. Um, but another thing that companies have done, Audemars Piguet came up with a chronograph that has not... It has a peripheral oscillating weight, so not oh, a central oscillating yeah, weight. Yeah, yeah, it goes around it's the a rim. It's around the rim, yep. and there's no connection to the center, yep, so there's yep, no bearing, yep. there's nothing hiding it. You pick it up, and it looks like a manually wound chronograph. You yeah. cannot see the weight. Boss. It's like and a then 2001 you feel A Space Odyssey, where it's like concentric rings, where it's just that ring. Like, yeah. It's like yeah. you just put a rim with a weight on one side of it. Yeah. It's like heavy. It's so Totally gangster. hidden in the outside of the case that you can't see. So. How do you not adopt that as standard if you're Audemars Piguet? Why it's wouldn't you expensive. take... That's a... So Audemars Piguet does not have a regular in-house chronograph. Okay. Meaning in their regular line of watches. They have chronographs that they make. Yeah, I had an APRP. offshore chronograph as a demo. Offshore chronograph? Royal Oak offshore chronograph. Uh, that one is going to be uh, a, one of their base movements. Uh-huh. One of their regular automatics, and yeah. then they have a Dubois de Pra module that oh, goes okay. on top. Okay, so modular, so sort of like what we looked at over over here. Exactly, just starting with a way higher level of base movement. Right, um, but that's what's typically in their watches, their regular line. Okay, they also have some other shared movements in their regular line for chronographs, but they do not produce their own chronograph in the regular line. It is only through APRP with their concept watches. So something like that is a concept watch. So mm. that's why you won't see it in the, the whole line. Oh, it's interesting. very expensive, very special, um, unique watch. Hmm. And at the just if I'm going back at the retail level, that this uh, uh, Panerai Regatta with uh, according according to you, not quite as nice as a movement as the Royal Oak Offshore Chronograph, right? Because this is the Eta base versus the although this is split seconds. That's a yeah. whole other and that. Because that's not a module, it's all integrated that's, into the movement. Oh, that's it's different. a little different. Okay, that's true. Um, but you're basically taking an Audemars Piguet design movement mm-hmm. and an Eta design movement, right. and one of them you're building on top of an Eta, and right. one of them you're putting a module on top of uh, an Audemars Piguet movement. So it's hard hmm. to even compare. So the two either, yeah, all right. So it's like, yeah, project car challenge. Like, are you yeah. building up a crazy, complicated twin turbo LS engine, or are you taking a Ferrari engine but putting it to like a gearbox out of a Corvette? Yeah, there you go. There's yeah. our there's our metaphor for <laughs> car metaphor for the day. All right. Uh, so that is uh, yeah, Zenith L Primero chronograph. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's used in uh, it's used in everything. We're in. <laughs> Yeah. In everything. <laughs> um, it's lovely. Right? Where do we go from there? Uh, let's what else do we have here? We've do, got so many chronographs. Let's, let's do the Hoyer. Okay, yeah. the Hoyer. Hoyer. Tag Hoyer. Known this is oh, not a tag. This is just Carrera Hoyer. Um, they, uh, what a beautiful watch. Small. Small watch. Vintage, vintage look. Yeah. Um, wait, I don't know. Is this a... This is not a vintage watch. No, it's That's not. A new, it's a new it's a watch. New, yeah, it's yeah. a reissue. It's the Caliber 17 reissue Carrera Hoyer. 3700 really bucks yeah. at Crown & Caliber. Um, you know, these things, they're not like 
uh, crazy fancy watches, but if you're into motorsport or yachting, you know, they seem to be well integrated with things that, like, they're like either at the very top of quote tool watches or like at the bottom of fancy watches, right? Yeah, I think like so. Ra- racers, like if you're out, if you're, you know, you you this is something like you'd use it. I yeah. feel like, right? It's a yeah. tool watch, but they're nice, and they're like, you know, Steve McQueen and that shit. Yeah, and they they're <laughs> definitely they have some really nice designs and forward thinking in their design. It's not like even though this is a vintage watch, it's kind of out there on the vintage side. Whereas if you look at the Bauman Mercier, that is kind of a vintage inspired watch. It's much more traditional. Tell me what the what do you mean? Just in terms of like a color scheme, I'm not sure what you mean. The Bound so, Mercier is more black. Yeah, with, black, and then it's got this like gilt, uh, you know, kind of a brassy uh, bronze colored hands, and then your very old numeral style. Uh, this looks like the dial. This looks like a vintage watch that was just blown up big. A yeah, watch from the fifties yeah, that they okay. just made it bigger. Right. Yeah. Um, like those Anikar Sherpa things we had back in our old those old episodes. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas the Carrera is a little more colorful, a um, little more. Uh, I feel modern. Like, yeah, I would Tag say. Tag did do like like what's like mid century modern. Like it's like yeah. that like Motorama kind of future fifties forward looking optimism colors. Yeah, like the we like the Monaco. You know what I mean? Definitely. Um, the Monaco is. I, I'm. I'm not a big fan of the of the Monaco, but uh, here's here's one. But uh, we had it on the show. You know that this is a watch that's like you gotta be you gotta be ballsy to wear square on square. Yeah, <laughs> it's really it's really square. <laughs> I I hate the Monaco. Do you like the, are you about it? I like the idea of it, but I can't actually wrap my head around wearing one. It's, no. it's really like a, a chunk of square. Yeah, so <laughs> much, so much square. You know who can wear these is like peep, like you got like a mega hipster who's wearing a scarf and really, you know, tight, tight <laughs> pants. You know, that's how, oh, you know, or your, or Steve McQueen. Yeah. That's true. Um, there, I don't have a whole lot to say about the tag. It's a, it's a, it's a nice, attractive watch. And yeah. If you have a wrist my size, it'll look really silly on you. you yeah. And if, if you're interested in chronographs, you have to look at some tag stuff. You definitely do. They're one of the original automatic chronographs, and they've just th- their business is chronographs. Yeah. That's and a the big guys part like Spike Ferriston, who's coming on the show next week. Oh. Um, he, you know, the guys who like who are into vintage racing and who hang out at Pebble Beach. They love Hoyers. They love yeah. them. Guys like me, I don't. I, I don't think we get them. We're too. We're either too young or no. We don't like Steve McQueen. But yeah. the guys who like Steve McQueen really like the Hoyers. Uh, yes, they do. Um, cool. What's next? Uh, next, let's go to. What is that? This is a this is a Vacheron with a Frederick Piguet movie. I, yeah, I like this a lot. The overseas chronograph. Yep. Um, designed nineteen seventy seven. I got my notes. Um, automatic 1130 caliber, 1137 movement. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you are qualified to service these, aren't you? Yeah. What, uh, what, what is, uh, what is the, the thing with these watches? I mean, other than being beautiful and, uh, well finished. Um, so we had in the, in these other watches, we were looking at some, some ETA based movements. Right. Um, and those had all different types of levels. Uh, this is a Frederick Piguet based caliber. Um, 1137 for Vacheron is what they call it. Uh, it's an 1185 Frederick Piguet base. And that movement is a really awesome movement. It's kind of reserved for higher level brands, but, uh, fully integrated. And instead of being a, uh, horizontal, this is going to be vertical. Okay. So, so other than, uh, is it typically the higher end is going to be vertical? And the lower end is going to be horizontal, or is that unrelated? Totally unrelated. Okay. Yeah, just different. Um, and what you've got, so in this watch, you have a wheel that is disengaged right now. Mm-hmm. Meaning the movement is turning, uh-huh. but it's not turning the hands. When I hit this button, 
that no wheel is going to move in the watch. Wait, 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 wait. The teeth are always engaged on this watch. Okay. Always engaged. Okay. And it's just not translating to the dial side. Oh, that's that's the distance. So is it not as harsh on the watch to engage it and disengage it because you're not slamming those teeth? Exactly. Oh. So there's no slamming in it. Okay. And you're essentially just uh, pinching two components so that they like a begin cuff? engaging. Yeah. Like a like a handbrake shoe on a car or something like um, that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So it's it's not a tooth slam. It's a clutch. It's a it's exactly. a compression grab. Oh. Yeah. Oh well, that's so nice. There's these these two parts that basically split apart on just like a clutch mm-hmm. uh, inside a cer- a one inside your chronograph wheel. Huh. Now, the tricky thing about that is that those wheels typically are assembled in such a way that they cannot be reoiled that easily. Oh, so servicing is annoying. So some of them can be reoiled. Typically, you're going to get a new one. It's mm. the best way to do it on that particular oh. wheel. So how much is a service for a watch like that? It's usually factored into the price because they know what movement's in the, oh, really? the watch, and it, it'll already be in there. Oh, okay. Um, that's, well, that's that, good to know. Yeah, if you send one of these back it hurts in... hurts on the front, but you're okay for the rest yeah. of your life? Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's the idea, and that's one of those things that you wouldn't necessarily know about. You could take this to a watchmaker who can't get that wheel, mm-hmm. and you might get the watch back and have some issues because that chronograph's not working properly. Right. Uh, someone simply just... because of that wheel, they just reused it. Yeah. Or... Uh, some watches that use a similar wheel can be re-oiled. Some cannot. Got it. So this is uh, an integrated chronograph, then? And this is an integrated chronograph. So the movement from from the beginning, from the ground up, was always intended to be a chronograph. Oh, okay. Uh, Whereas the modular one... Does Vacheron then put this in a a fancy kind of watch, too? Like a non-sport watch also? Yeah, you'll see this in other watches that are not sport watches. Yeah. This just happens to be in this overseas chronograph, uh, unless you go to the new ones... They came out with their own chronograph now. Oh, really? In the brand new overseas. What's it? Is it still called overseas? Yeah, overseas. Uh, I'm just gonna type 2018 and see. Yeah. Does it look different? Yes, it, it'll be slightly different. Uh, blue? Uh, no, the blue is gonna be an older one. Here we go. That's a this new guy? one. Yeah. 2016. As of 2016. Here it is. So if you look at this, uh-huh. this is a different movement. We don't have a display back on the one we've got. No, but unfortunately. we've got a Blanc Pond that uses the same movement. Oh, way <laughs> to have the examples. Back. There it is. Oh, hang on. Focus. So, there it is. That's the other movement. And so, the first thing right, that I would we'll look at here. Zoom in here and then compare you to you. So the first thing, just yeah. look at your oscillating weight. That's the easiest just way to tell. Just the shape of the oscillating weight? There's three screws on that Vacheron oscillating weight with a big bearing. Okay. And on the Frederick Piguet, yeah. you actually have one central point hmm. where it attaches. And that'll be the quickest, easiest way to see the difference. Gotcha. Um, but other than that, you're also going to see on the Vacheron, yeah. you've got things like a Geneva seal. The Geneva seals are here, yeah. Uh, right over here. Yeah which is just a different standard that they get for finishing and testing and everything, kind of like COSC, except yeah. it's more decoration and high-level oriented instead of just timing. These are very... They don't make, unfortunately... I looked. They don't make this overseas in a size that fits men of a certain stature. <laughs> They're all kind of small. It's a bummer. Um, when I was going to ask, with the integrated uh, chronograph movements, can you then make the watch thinner because you're not stacking as much? Yes, initially right. it can be thinner. Right. Yeah. I figured. I figured. But if you start with a thick integrated watch, then you're stuck with a thick integrated watch. That's a good point. Uh, what? Wait, that. Oh, do we? Have, that that um that Blanc Pond is very nice. It's yeah. also very rare. They only made 333 pieces of those. Yeah, and I don't know if if everyone saw that. This case back. It's a special Hunter case back, and it actually pops open. So. It's kind of cool. I, I have... I mean, honestly, w- other than cocaine, what would you do with it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, who needs a uh, like a mirrored thing that opens on the back of their watch? So to me, the cool part about it is that you get that extra magnetic resistance. 
Oh, so really? That your watch won't magnetize as easily. Oh, does that? Is there, there's um, a functional a functionality to that. Yeah, oh, it okay. protects the back from sunlight as well. Not that it should get much sunlight. Um, yeah, sunlight is damaging for oils. Yeah, but like it's against your wrist. Exactly, it shouldn't really oh, ever boy. be out in the sun. What about? And obviously, the oils should be designed for the heat of your wrist because that's yeah. where they'll be. Yeah, they can handle the the warmth, but okay. uh, yeah, it's, it's just something to kind of protect the back and it hides it a little bit, but. For me, I think that's pretty Flip it cool over. You haven't unique. shown the face of that watch. Yeah. The Blanc Pawn Half Hunter. What is yeah. st- it's such a stupid name. And this <laughs> and when we're we're zoomed actually, we're zoomed way in. Put it um when you zoom out, it looks beautiful. Right. Put it next to uh the uh I don't know, what's a normal size watch? Do we have a normal um, size watch? Um th- this this Bomb Mercier, which I think is a forty two or a forty three, which is a more like popular size for for um, the modern sport watch, it's small. That's a thirty-eight. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the Blanc Pons thirty-eight. Blanc right? thirty-eight. Yeah, you got to be a, a lot of this really expensive stuff and the vintage stuff. You you have to be a smaller person to wear. That Vacheron is dope, but yeah. I just it will not fit. Can't do it. Um, great. What's left? What do we have here? We've got an Omega. Yeah, let's uh, got, let's hop go, over to that Omega. You want to go Omega Planet Ocean? Yes. Chronograph. This one it is. A B E A U T full watch. Can you adjust it a bit, Mr. Weiss? And I adjust the framing. I like these watches very, very much. And if you are a bigger gentleman like me, they look good on your wrist. Now, I am going to show you something here because we talked about how hard the chronograph function is on a watch. Yeah. How like, intense. It's just very intense starting, stopping, and resetting a watch. So. That being said, mm-hmm. this chronograph is running right now. Mm-hmm. See the hand at about the 6 o'clock? yellow hand, orange hand? So, I just stopped it. Yeah. Let's reset it. Whoa. What happened there? You see that? It did, it's at about 10 seconds It reset right now. to 10 seconds. It did not yeah. reset to zero. Que paso aquí? So, what's happening is that hand has so much force as it's resetting, uh-huh. the hand is coming loose from the pinion it's on. Oh. Yeah. Oops, this thing's so, a little servicio. Yeah, so this one will get a service. <laughs> so this thing, it, like, it broke its own arm off, basically. Yep. yep. Yeah. Did it? Do you? Th- did it shear off the gear? Do um, you think? Or no. It... What probably happened is the second hand stretched out a little bit because oh. the, there's a sleeve that press fits very tightly, uh-huh. and it's very tight. We actually adjust it as a watchmaker. We get the hands uh, when we need a new one. So this one will need a new hand. There's no way to tighten this hand. Oh. It is garbage. This hand will be tossed, and then you'll get a new hand from Omega. You will actually use uh, some special um, special tools that are tiny little slivers of these cutting tools that will go into the hand. We will trim off some material till it's just the right diameter and press the hand on so that it's just the right tightness. Oh, man. Can you do that on the show? Um, <laughs> do you need tools that you don't have here? I could do it on the show, but I don't have the tools for that right here, right now. Oh well, good but demo yeah. of how a chronograph can eat itself. Yeah. So uh, this watch needs a servicio. Yep, and it'll get a new second hand and a full service, and be good to go. Well, they should be uh, very glad that we discovered this issue <laughs> before it got out to a customer. Right, Crown and Caliber. These are, you know, what which Planet Ocean I really like is the orange bezel. There's one that's got like a fire orange. Like a sunbursty colored yeah. bezel on it looks really, really good. Yep, these are lovely watches. And, and this one, yeah, same movement as the Blanc Pan, same movement as the uh, Vacheron. Wow, except this one has coaxial, so yeah. a different escapement loaded into uh, the original movement. How interesting! And is that yeah. wha- what would you make that change for? Cost reduction or for just a different task or? Well, for, definitely not a cost reduction. Not um, a cost reduction. No, because Omega started out by putting it in ETA movements, mm-hmm. and they had the 2892 with a coaxial escapement in it, 2892 ETA movement, which is a solid workhorse uh, automatic with date. They integrated the coaxial escapement parts into that movement. Then they also put it into this movement, they did that for a while, and so then they sort of their, their own caliber. All right, so th- that's their yeah. MO anyway. Okay. Yeah, so it's a high-level movement that they started with, and then they added their own complication to it, which is impressive. 
Um, let's. I think that's what I'm consistently impressed with about Omega is you see you you have over and over talked about how awesome their movements are. Yeah, and yet on these price sheets, they're right? never even close to as expensive as the watches get. I mean, yeah. that watch, granted, okay, that one's a little broken. All right, but let's assume it's not. You're talking about a watch that goes. How deep does that thing go? Uh, it's got to be a super thousand deep, feet. right? Um, what does it say? It's like a super deep watch. It's got a helium escape valve 2, on it. 2,000 feet. 2,000 foot watch with a chronograph, shares a movement with a Blanc Pond and a Vacheron. Yeah. It's 3,100 bucks. I mean, yeah. that's not nothing, but the Vacheron is 10. The Blanc Pond's 10. Right. Like, isn't it? Wait, what's the Blanc Pond? It's Blanc Pond is, uh, Blanc Pond is six, six or seven. The Vacheron's 10. Yeah. You know, and this and this thing has the depth. Yeah. You know? That's that's awesome. Right? So that it's pretty impressive that they're able to do that. And that has to do with owning Frederick Piguet as yeah. well. <laughs> there you go. Watch out go back and do the family tree episode. Oh, yeah. I like those planet oceans. What is left on the table? Well, we've got we've talked about I mean, just let's let's do thirty seconds on it because yeah. because we should talk about it. The sake this Grand Seiko Spring Drive. We've talked about this same exact watch like four times in the first ten episodes of the show. <laughs> so I don't want to dwell on it, but it's a spring drive. And you know it was a bummer? I went back and watched the episode that we did about the different movements. And you couldn't see the sweep? The f- we're shooting at 30 FPS on this yeah. on this thing, and I can't... That was the old camera, though. Run the chronograph. Let's see if we can see. Have you been wearing this? Is it wound up? I've been wearing it. Yeah, All it's right. fully wound. There we go. Look, according to my monitor, yeah, I my see monitor it. in the studio shows the it perfectly smooth, smooth right? sweep. I don't know yeah. if the export will. The export might have a bit rate issue. But spring drive is slickered and greased owl shit, <laughs> as they say. I love my spring drive uh, Grand Seiko. I have been wearing this watch a lot. It's really, really nice. It's nice to look at. One of my favorite things to do with this watch is to wait until uh, the sun gets really low and comes into the windows of my house. It's that really strong, like intense, direct sun. And then use the 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 polished parts on that dial of the Grand Seiko to reflect patterns onto my wall. <laughs> like crazy patterns. It's really cool. Um, so spring drive, as pertains to chronographs, um, it actually is to its benefit, right? Because the the spring drive wheel doesn't oscillate. It moves in one direction which I think helps with chronographs, doesn't it? Doesn't it make your life easier? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, You know, I've never worked on a spring drive, so... We should. I well, don't really know. You want to take this you, one Yeah, apart? do you mind if I pop this one open and uh, oh, take it apart? Oh, <laughs> no. I can't, because this one I actually get wet. Ah. Uh, this thing we'll, has... We'll have to talk to Seiko and see if they can send us uh, something, some diagrams I'm sure or, they a part, would. or a watch to kind of explore the insights. I have talked about to a few people about doing an all Seiko episode yeah. and it's been a very popular topic with fans also because Definitely. like a a good Seiko like can be ha- Remember that $200 one you brought in here? Yeah. That was like an awesome watch for 200 right? bucks. I mean, uh so not much to say about Grand Seiko except that that chronograph doesn't tick. It's just glides. Yeah. And watching it is very mesmerizing. Uh, what else do we have? Do we have? Well, from we there, have, from are we done, or is that are we at the 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 big the big bad mama jamma? Where did that one? Where did it go? Where well, did there you put it? it? Uh, this right one here. I'm so excited about one. the Lang and yeah. what this watch. This is now the new uh, most expensive watch that we featured in studio. The Lang and Son Datagraph. Flyback. Oh, hit the hit the focus button. I think we're a little out of focus on it. It's too pretty. There we go. There we go. It's so nice. It's platinum. It's heavy. Very heavy. It's very heavy. Um, what? So what is it? What is it about this watch? I, I think it's. I think it's. Yeah. It's what is it not? And what it's a very short list of what it's not. What is it? All right. What is it not? <laughs> we haven't talked. We have actually not really um, talked about. Oh that yeah that's the right? that's the big the big bad home run is that and if I think you probably have to hit the the thing the it Focus doesn't again yeah it doesn't quite in person like our camera I, we got to pull up a, an online photo as well Lang um went back to 1845 is when they uh they first 
Open. Oh, that's there. You go. Right. Thank you. Get Cameron. a little angle, yeah, on, angle that light. on that light. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Uh, in Glashut, Germany, uh, it was uh, the first European watchmaker ever to use the metric system, which I found to be a, a fun fact. And, I, and then they made it all the way through World War II until the very last day of the war. Their factory yeah. was destroyed on the last day of the war. Um, and it was confiscated by East Germany. Who knows what they did with it? And then uh, in the end of the 80s, it was reestablished by the uh, by the grandson of the original founders, and they made their first new watch in 1994. Yeah, there's a little history. And now they're extremely, extremely pimp. So what are some of the hallmarks of, uh, of a Lang? Um, well, one thing is going to be the... the German uh, silver bridges. When you look at this movement, it has a little bit of a gold tint to it. And it's because of that German silver. It's not like a rhodium that's bright white silver. Uh huh. These are German silver bridges. You're also going to have... Just a different color, right? Yeah, a slightly different color uh-huh. because it's a, it's a material that's not plated. Okay. So that is the material that you're seeing rather it's than, raw all rather the way than brass and then oh, plated. Okay. Um, so it's cut that way and then finished, decorated. You've also got your blue screws. You've got your gold chitons. Um, What's which, a chiton? Uh, so <laughs> it holds the jewel, and it is the gold circle around the jewel. Okay. Then you have three blue screws that hold that in there, that whole unit. So it's one piece. Uh, it's out of tradition because they used to rub in jewels. Which Sorry? means rub in jewels, burnishing them in. Okay. Basically, they would place a jewel into a hole, and then they would use a special tool that would basically put a burr around the jewel to hold it there. Okay. And when you replace that, you have to upsize. Oh yeah. You have to kind of drill it out. Yeah. Pushings and things like that. Yeah. So for the long term, it's not great. Whereas this, you remove the whole unit, you can make a new unit that then fits in there. So it's a traditional thing, and they they should be made out of gold, and then they hold the jewel, and then it's placed in there. So it's very hard to make those and have everything be perfect, uh, and it's also beautiful because you have gold, blue, red, and German silver all in one little area on all these jewels. So there's a lot of color there and I depth. Get, like more light on it. I feel like it's not like we're not doing it justice. Right? I feel like right. Like what if we put like a cell phone light on it or something like. What happens? Can we get a light and make it look just crazy? Because it's, I can't really, in person, it is, there, you can hold that. That that helps. In person, it is so, is that like, too? bright and vivid and, like, complex. And, like, the the I whole guess. watch is about the that, the back of the watch. Yeah. It helped when you actually tilted the watch a little more, Cameron, I think, to get some, like, dimension, all that. Ooh. Ah. Get rid of the light and just tilt the watch. Right? Like yeah. this? Yeah, because then at least you see the depth. Like, it's just so layered and it's like so yeah. open. It's like, it's almost like they're inviting you to check their work. You know Definitely. what I mean? That like, is exactly it. Like, we're not hiding this. Like, look at every element of this and I dare you to find something off. Yeah. You know, it's so pimp. And I thought, because I only saw pictures of this thing. Like uh, zoomed in, you know, when you when you look at a picture of a watch on the internet, it's like, you know, it can fill a 27 inch monitor, you yeah. know. So when I got this watch and put it on, um, it's very small, like it's a 38 or something, which is pretty small for 2018 standards. And it's heavy, yeah. really, really heavy. It's very dense. Yeah. Um, and flip it back over. We, we didn't re- even really look at the dial. So how does it what it, what makes it other than being just spectacularly pretty what 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 can you tell from the front of this watch that makes it really cool Well you've got your big date Big date is a complication even, in its own Yeah it's separate from date Yeah big separate date from and date. date are complete our whole other why are big date different and well, from regular date because it's two separate Here's a regular date Yeah Can you even see where it is I can. It's at the bottom right? of the lower subdial, but it's not You really got to squint to look at it's it. It's not good. It's not a main focus of the watch. Big date is like in your face, easy, look down, you see the date very quickly. It is a display of the date 
not just out of necessity. It's trying to make the date even more prominent and uh, doing it in such a way that is not ugly. Yeah. It's complicated. Well, on the, on the Lang, it appears that the two and the three are not connected. It's showing no, they are the, not. It's showing the date is the 23rd, and it appears that the two and the three are different wheels, windows. Yeah, and they have a little frame here to cover the seam. Yeah. So is that how you make a big date fit in the top of a small watch? Yeah. By doing, so you'll you, have two wheels that come together. Right, right. Yeah. So that adds complications. And then, you know, I noticed the sub-dials for the chronograph are not at like 6, 9, and 12. Like they're yeah. at like 4 and 8. Slightly lower than the center there. Yeah. So is like having them not fully centered like an extra just like, ha-ha, look what we do. Yeah. It's right? an extra design element that separates them from everybody else. Yeah. Uh, and it also, I think, is pretty pleasing to have them not line up, especially because you've got that big date up at the top. Yeah. So it kind of balances out it out by not having the chronograph registers on the same level as the hour minute pinion. Um, I forget how many of these there are, but there are not a lot. Yeah. Um, this apparently has 400 parts... And forty joules with a, with a thirty six hour power reserve, um, and uh, oh. they apparently don't come for come up for sale very often. They're they're tough to find. I'm just gonna wind, just wind it, up it up so we can run it. And uh, Crown and Caliber would like me to tell you that this one is in like new condition and available for sale right now. It Somebody nice. should buy this. It's yeah. fresh. I mean, I you know I don't. And I don't. We don't feature a lot. Most of the watches we've featured have been just standard stainless steel. We haven't featured a lot of really precious metals so far in the show. Matter of fact, I think we should do a precious metals show. We should do an episode on precious metals. But um, this watch is very pretty. And when you put on a precious metal watch, a really nice, ahead, only you know. Yeah, especially you, platinum. It's hard yeah. to spot that from across the room unless you know that that model was not yeah. available. Yeah, or stainless. white gold too. There's yeah. some. There's some super DL Rolex Rolexes where it's like, oh, I know that color bezel means white gold, and that's and that's the right. only reason you know. But but it to wear one, it literally weighs like fifty percent more. It's so much heavier. Yeah, it's strictly a personal satisfaction thing. What are you doing? I just did the the date jump there. Oh god just damn it! Can you oh, do you another it. one? I missed uh, it. I wasn't just, watching. You'll have to watch it next. I'll week. have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Check out next week. You'll have when, to watch it when listen. we go to the twenty fifth. <laughs> um, this what I mean forty three thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. It's not amateur hour, is it? So um, you've also got your quick set. Oh yeah, do that. So we'll do the quick set here. This is very cool. It has a button on the opposite side of the crown to quick set your date, and it every time you press it, it jumps ahead one. So you don't yep. have to pull out your crown and start spinning around hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to uh, to jump ahead. Uh, and especially, you know, because you're typically jumping ahead from thirty one to one or twenty, yeah, whatever. Hit the button once, it's just, and you're good to it's go. a one hit it, and it's done. And it, yeah. and I think when you make a feature like that easy to use, people are more likely to use it. Yeah. Although now, as the care, I said on a couple episodes ago, as the caretaker of a perpetual calendar, not only am I, you know, personally committed to having all those things be accurate, you know, for as long as I have to, yeah. but now when I put on another watch, any other watch, I have to make sure the date is right. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't care about that stuff before. Yeah. Now, doing this podcast and having a complicated watch, now I care across the spectrum about it. Yeah. So. I think uh, that is a very nice cross selection of uh, chronographs. Let's end with go back to the Lang movement. We can pretty much, we can pretty much. Oh, let let's let it run. Wait, yeah. Put so it now on. You a, can see the balance. Put it on an running. angle and let's like let it let it let it go there. Uh, can we focus it? Can you hit the focus Ooh. again? Uh, let me see. You, you got that? Yeah, yeah, right, I got yeah. It. Hold Here. the focus. Oh, I just want to watch it like spin over and over. That is so cool. God. Well, so in here, note, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can uh -huh. see the crown wheel, uh -huh. and I'm going to point to it right now. You've got your crown wheel right here. Also, people call it the castle wheel because it looks kind of like the top of a castle, um, and that is your mechanical memory that allows you to start, stop, reset with all of these little hammers that essentially drop into so wait, the if voids. You, if you can, if you can, you start it. Can you? Yeah, will will see. we see it moving right now? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. If we if let me start it? this chronograph okay. here. Okay. Start it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the the big Stop. hammer just moved. Yep. So that starts and stops it at the bottom of your screen there. Yep. And then so give us a reset. Um, let me just make sure I'm. Is it not running right now? Yeah. All right. So it's it's in the stop position. Okay. Are we still focused or no? I think you I think you messed it up. You got to refocus. Let's refocus. So there it is. Let's get this right. Get it right. Okay. So See, now I just want to stare at the back of this reset. watch for like hours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, it's a very intricate set of little dance that happens yeah. there. Do you, I man, it's I love that Lang had just made these parts like as thin as they could possibly be so they don't obstruct your view of right? anything else. Well, and it's a manually wound chronograph. Yeah. This is why I love manually wound chronographs. Yeah, if it had an automatic rotor on the back. It, it, everything would be no. 50% obscured all the time. No, but what if they did the ring thing that, that yeah. AP did? That would be boss. Yeah. That would be extremely boss. It would be, and it'll take your $43,000 chronograph yeah, and turn it into an $85,000 <laughs> chronograph. <laughs> well, <laughs> that was awesome. Now I feel like I know about chronographs. That's very cool. I mean, there's a lot of samenesses and a lot of uh, different takes on, on it. It's really neat. Yeah. That's so cool. All right. Deep dive into chronographs. Another <laughs> episode of Watch and Listen. There we go. Uh, if you like what you saw... Every single watch on the show, except my Grand Seiko today, is available at and my Bound Mercy <laughs> available <laughs> at CrownandCaliber.com. Uh, especially that Lang, get it while it's hot. Um, anyway, uh, what do you want to you want to plug anything, Cameron? Uh, Weiss Watch Company. WeissWatchCompany.com. We don't do a chronograph yet. <laughs> you should, Cameron M Weiss on Instagram, Weiss Watch Company on Instagram, the Smoking Tire Matt Farah on Instagram. Um, and uh, I love your comments on the videos. I love your constructive criticisms, as long as you're nice about it, which most of you are. Please go, if you listen on iTunes, uh, please leave a comment or a rating. Um, it does help keep us high in the rankings, and we do appreciate it very much. Um, next up, I don't know. I think we got Spike in studio next show. Um, but I, uh, I am learning so much making this fucking podcast, man. This is great. I really, really like it. Thank you to Crown and Caliber for spending, uh, sending us all these watches to use on the show. Code Matt150. I know it's not much if you're going to buy a five or $6,000 watch for me to give you $150. But on the other hand, MATT150 is $25 a keystroke to type in. Even Bill Gates wouldn't turn down $25 a keystroke to type in a discount code on a website. And uh, thanks to all of you. And uh, Cameron? Cheers, my friend. I'll see you later. Good night.